Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Second Class Molly Ellinger. Welcome to the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. It is my privilege to welcome our guest speaker, retired Colonel Michelle Mo Barrett. Mo began her distinguished career in the same way that many of us have, as a cadet at the United States Air Force Academy. She notes herself as being a successful failure while at the Academy and fought on after becoming the first member of her pilot training class to receive an unsatisfactory grade. Despite it all, she became a pilot, going on to fly the C-27A and the C-5. Following September 11, 2001, Mo deployed with a small team to Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, converting mere fields into aircraft hubs. Mo has a distinguished career marked by overcoming adversity. She has dealt with the shame, the stigma, the struggle, and the success of being a lifelong nonconformist in the military's structured environment. After 25 years of service, she retired with the rank of Colonel, citing hard work and the ability to view any situation with optimism, humor, and perspective as what helped her manage and excel throughout her Air Force career and life in general. She has not only survived, but thrived as a multi-minority. Today, she connects with audiences of all ages as a DC tour guide, podcast co-host, and storyteller. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a true privilege to present to you, Colonel Retired Mo Barrett. Holy and thank you to the Academy. My name is Mo Barrett, and it has been 10,130 days since I graduated from this fine institution. Now, I wasn't fortunate enough to get into the zoo on my first try, but thanks to the Falcon Foundation, Northwestern Prep, and Community College, I made it here. But I never thought I would be asked to come back after I threw my hat in the air, so I am super excited and a little surprised to be here. Now, I retired. 1,061 days ago, and now I am traveling all over my living room as an anecdotist to help people laugh, learn, and think. Okay, we're going to go through some notes, cautions, and warnings first. The first note is this is not going to be your typical keynote. That's all I'm going to say about that. Molly, uh, you can let me know if HQ is uh, freaking out over there in Polaris. Caution, we are going to be interactive here. You will need a blank piece of paper, a writing implement, and if you're able, please now start logging into Kahoot.it on a separate device and use the game pin 985 I have it set to auto-generate nicknames, so just accept whatever the random generator generates and go on. If you are not able to Kahoot in, you're missing out, so keep trying to get into Kahoot. I also want you to know that no one has ever died during one of my presentations. So be sure that you are doing all the interactive stuff. It is only fun if you do it. Now, before we get rolling, this will be our first Kahoot poll. I want to know in one word how you are feeling. And unless everyone knows you as Lucky Buffalo, and that's precisely the random nickname that Kahoot generated for you, this truly is non-attribution. So head on over to kahoot.it on a separate device, use pin 985 and get ready. I want you to start thinking about one word to describe how you're feeling. And I probably shouldn't have to tell you this, but make sure we keep this PG-18 because you know some big, big wig is watching. And if one person poops their pants, everybody's got to wear diapers. So I am looking for one word to describe how you are feeling. And I really want to know. I don't want to be hearing fine or okay. All right. So this is taking into consideration the current state of affairs. Less than 100 days to get the firsties out of here. The two digs having a ring payment due. The nature of the symposium, the time of day, taking all of that into consideration. All right. So it looks like people are logging in. One word. I'm just looking for one word. How are you feeling? You have 30 seconds. Oh, people are typing. Oh, look, people are typing in answers. I love this. Kind of excited. Uh oh, there's a big, big answer there. Absolutely. The pin is going to kahoot.it. The pin number is 985. 5608 
And we'll be using Kahoot quite a bit, so feel free to log in a little bit later. All right, let's see how everybody's feeling. This is a word cloud, so whatever is in that big blue box. Excited, wow. Are you excited for me to be done? Is that is that what's going on? Okay. Tired, happy, blessed, motivated. All right, so we've got mostly excited, a little bit overwhelmed and stressed. I get it. Second question. This is a geography question. I wanna know where you are. If you are here at the zoo, tell me what dorm and what floor. If you're at home, tell me specifically what room in your home you're zooming from. But for the love of toilet plungers, if you are in the bathroom, please lie and pick any other room and type that in. Again, I want to know where are you physically sitting or standing? I'm talking dorm and floor or building name or specific room of the house. And if we get mostly Polaris, I'll know that uh, it's all the IT guys playing along. People are answering. I love this. 10 seconds. If I see bathroom on there, we're going to have issues. Oh, people are playing. I like it. All right, two seconds left. Let's see what's in that big red box. No, big blue box now. Kitchen, office, living room, home office room. Las Vegas. Side. Somebody wrote my mom. Okay, excellent. My mom says hi. All right, fantastic. We are not done with Kahoot, so leave it open, or you can always log back in later if you accidentally log out. All right. I'm assuming that a lot of you have either been through soaring or powered flight or both, which means you went through the confidence maneuver of stalling the plane. Some of you may have liked stalls. Some of you loved them. Maybe some of you don't even remember them. I definitely remember stalls. It's the summer after my freshman year, and because I am of sound mind, I choose the stay in the plane option instead of jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. And today, we're going to stall the airplane. And this is that asinine confidence maneuver they do, which means we're going to starve the aircraft of airspeed by disrupting the airflow under the wing that normally keeps the plane aloft. And this is so that I can learn to recognize or prevent a stall from happening or recover from a stall if I fail to recognize or prevent a stall from happening. So here I sit in a motorized glider next to a full on commissioned officer. He's an instructor pilot and he's stuck flying with me. And here I am sitting thinking I'm all that because I made it through my first year at the Air Force Academy. He points the nose of the plane to the sky. He pulls back on the throttle. We lose upward momentum and the plane starts shaking. Now we're in the stall and the plane is gonna look for its flying attitude. I'm expecting the plane to go from nose high to nose low because my instructor told me the plane would go from nose high to nose low. I'm a bit of a planner, so I like to know what's about to happen. So I'm a little caught off guard when the plane today goes from nose high to right wing low. All sky to my left, nothing but ground to my right. The instructor dumps the plane straight over and now there is no sky anywhere in my field of sight. We nosedive toward death while he tinkers with the stall recovery like it's the most boring thing in the world. After our near death experience and a short stint of Tourette's, we're finally flying straight and level. I get my breathing under control and I make the decision to play it cool because you know, I'm all that because I made it through my first year at the zoo. My intentions are always good, but sometimes in the heat of a moment, my execution leaves something to be desired. Like today. Here's cadet, I'm all that Barrett, flying uneventfully straight and level in the clear blue gorgeous Colorado sky, having just been through a stall recovery, then looking down to see that at some point during the stall, I grabbed my instructor's leg. That's right. There's nothing smoother, smoother than grabbing your instructor's leg. And despite realizing just how inappropriate this is, I can't seem to let go. I mean, I do eventually, but this is not how I intended to start out my airmanship career. That split second choice was a poor one, but it informed follow on decisions in similar situations or identical situations in my aviation career. And it guided my behavior for future stalls. And it made me realize that the best split second decisions take years to make. So how do we take the time to develop those split second decisions? 
We treat our experiences, our actions, our decisions like an internal combustion engine. Now, listen, all you aero engineers, I don't need you critique in my lesson. This is gonna be at my comprehension level. And for all of my right brain friends, fear not, my comprehension level is not a high bar. I may not be an aero major and French minor like my guide Molly today, or an Oxford bound holiday scholar like our wing queen, Emily. So I'm just gonna say this, an internal combustion engine at its most basic level converts energy to action. I'll get out of the way here, sorry. A four stroke engine has four distinct processes, intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. But for those of you who, like me, operate at the maturity level of a 12-year-old, I'm using suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Or if you're a Boeing 777 fan blade, fatigue, fail, break, chip, fall. Is that too soon? That might be too soon. All right, let's just stick with the four-stroke internal combustion engine. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Okay, great. Aeronautical Engineering 101 is complete. And any dreams of being uh, uh, sponsored by Boeing are now gone forever. But what does suck, squeeze, bang, blow have to do with developing good split second decisions? Travel back in time with me to 19, well, let's just say it's before don't ask, don't tell was even a thing. I've been accepted to this fine institution and now I'm at my DOD military examination review board. You know, that last final interview to dot the T's and cross the I's. Any illegal drug use? No, sir. True story. I didn't even drink in high school. Any criminal record? No, sir. Also a true story. My friends didn't have a curfew if their parents knew they were hanging out with me. Any problems with homosexuality? Yikes. Now, I've known I was gay since I was four years old, and I also know the military at this time prohibits someone with my condition. But I also know that I am more than just gay, and I have a contribution to make as a public servant. My conviction about my assets as a leader outweigh this particular aspect of my identity. So my response to whether I have any problems with homosexuality is, no, sir, which is true. I don't have any problems with homosexuality. In fact, I'm quite good at it. Obviously, I knew what the guy was asking. And um, any, I'm happy to discuss later any obvious ethical quandaries of my answer, but I knew that gay was just a part of the total mixture that makes me, me. In an internal combustion engine, the engine sucks in this air-fuel mixture, just like our decision-making process takes in this blended mix of all of our characteristics, our past experiences, our age, our personalities, our upbringing, our different views on the world. Different engine operating conditions require different air-fuel ratios for maximum efficiency and power, and the different operating conditions of our lives require different blends of who we are. The operating conditions of a personal decision are different than those of an academic decision, just like a career decision requires a different mix of traits than if we're making a romantic decision. Well, except I know you all love the Air Force, so that's a bad example, but I trust you get my point. We all have this healthy mix of different identities that impact our decision making. Everyone we meet is more than the label that's been pinned on them. They are more than the judgment we make about them. Most of you may wear the same Air Force Academy uniform, but I know that cadet is only one part of your mixture. Some of you might be prior enlisted or have gone through the prep school or have been a Falcon Foundation scholar or even been so lucky as to have survived Northwestern prep. And you have an identity and a role beyond just cadet. Roles within your flight or your squadron, your class, your group, or your athletic team. So grab a piece of paper and a writing tool. This is gonna be a valuable exercise that only you can complete. You're gonna take a quick inventory of you. So I want you to start thinking of all the roles that you play. And if it helps to capture some broad buckets, use USAFA, community, and home as those bins. Or if you're not a cadet or permanent party here at USAFA, go ahead and say work, community, and home as your bins. 
The easy and obvious one you can start with is your role here as a cadet, or if you're faculty here, you can start with faculty. So write down cadet or faculty and we'll all have at least one role captured. But then start thinking about any additional duties you have here at the zoo and write those down. Are you the squadron snacko? Are you the superintendent? Are you on group staff? Do you ever sit CQ? Think about the roles you play in the local community, your neighborhood, your church, your cadet clubs. Are you a tutor? Are you a coach? Do you shelve books at the library? Write down those roles. Think about the roles you play at home with your friends, with your family. Are you a nibbling? Don't get perverted. A nibbling is a niece or nephew. See, the more you know, we're already learning. Are you the family mediator? Do you have siblings? Just let this be a verbal vomit, mind map it, and let your brain go from one role to the next to the next. We're doing this to get a grasp of all the roles that we juggle on a daily basis. And it's important that you do this because we're going to build on this in a few minutes. It may seem like a really basic thing to do, but it's easy to forget all the you's that make you, you. Now, some of you may have already jotted down a few different roles, so take a look at how many you came up with. And we're switching back over to Kahoot. And I want to know how many roles you were able to capture. And this is multiple choice. This is an easy one. All you need to do is just count out how many roles you were able to inventory. So the red one means you wrote down either just one role. The blue one means you got around five different roles in your life. The yellow tab means that you got more than 10. And the green one means that you are super high achievers and you stopped counting at 20 roles. So count out how many roles you play in your life. All right, three seconds. Gotta love the multiple choice. All right, so I'm gonna need to know those 2% uh, of the people who wrote down one roll. Uh, okay, so a bulk of you found between five and 10 roles that you have. And that's something to consider. And as you kind of think about the day, maybe just start thinking about the other roles that you have. And somebody's typing in zero, uh-oh. Every time I do this exercise, I learn of a role that someone else captured that also applies to me, but that I forgot. For example, for some reason, I always forget daughter, but we are all someone's son or daughter. And there are responsibilities that come with that role, regardless of whether they are expected or unexpected, fulfilled or neglected, self-imposed or imposed upon you. And remember that roles evolve over time. For example, my mom suffers from dementia. Well, <laughs> I don't think she suffers from it. I think she enjoys asking me the same question 18 times in the span of a five minute conversation. You all have physical training PT. I now have patience training PT. The point is my role as a daughter has now evolved to my role as a caregiver. So as we head back to Kahoot, I'd like you to look at your list of, of roles and I want you to circle the three roles that you are most proud of. And really, I just want to see if there are any more roles that I left off my list. So once we get Kahoot spinning again, you'll be typing in the three roles that you're most proud of. And if you want to log back into Kahoot again, or for the first time, you're going to Kahoot.it and the pin is 985-5608, excuse me. And if you're not able to log into Kahoot, shame on you. Just kidding. If you're not logged into Kahoot, still look at your roles and circle the three that you're most proud of. Now for this question in Kahoot, to submit your three roles, you'll enter each role separately. Type in one role, then hit submit. Then you'll get a chance to type in the second role, then hit submit, and then the third role, then hit submit. I gave you a little bit more time on this one. Yeah, people are type fast typers. I like it. Top three roles you're most proud of. We'll see if we can't sort these out if we have some common ones as they come in. And again, I encourage you to do this, even if you can keep adding to your list during the day, but look at all the roles that you play in your life. And this is a participative, participative group. I love it. So 
So as these roles come in, one of the things that we'll do is just kind of look at the list and we'll scroll through a little bit rapidly just in the interest of time, but look at the other roles that people have chosen to write down that they're proud of and see if maybe those are some roles that should have been on your list, maybe not necessarily in your top three, but maybe on your list that maybe you left out. Well, 10 seconds as everybody's typing in. And I appreciate everybody playing. All right, probably should have gotten a drum roll sound here. We're gonna sort some of these ideas out. Kahoot's working its magic. Man, you guys are making Kahoot think. Let's see what we got here. Friend, best friend, teammate, girlfriend, brother, older. Hey, someone, so someone put in their older brother and brother, and I think that's an important distinction because I have five siblings, which means I have the role of sister five times because the roles with my different siblings are different. Youngest of 10, immigrant, financial supporter, flight commander, Christian, chaplain, E7, cadet wing commander. Oh, look at Emily's typing in there. Coach, paramedic, firefighter. Wow. These are great. These are great roles to be proud of. Good, good, good. Advocate for L. This is great. All right. So I, I'm going to go look at this on my own, but uh, think about the roles that you're proud of, okay? These are a list of all the different roles that fuel our decision-making rubric. Now, with any given role, there are probably some societal expectations about how we should behave in that role. Now, I'm guessing it's also a safe bet to say that there are a few type A action-oriented decision-makers watching. And when people like us set out to do something, we become very single-minded in focus and determination. And we don't want other people getting in the way of what we want, like a door knocker. Don't we all want that? Well, today, my partner Jen and I are out shopping for a door knocker for our new home. Because we're both pilots in the Air Force, it shouldn't be a big surprise that we are in the market for a door knocker in the shape of an airplane. We go to a store that specializes in door knockers. Now, personally, I think the owner missed a huge opportunity in naming the place, but I digress because again, I have the maturity level of a 12 year old and I think that suck, squeeze, bang, blow is funny. Okay, Jen and the owner have a quick dialogue that I watch from the sidelines and it starts with Jen. We're looking for a plane knocker. Oh, we have plenty of those. Well, looks like we've come to the right place. We've been searching on Amazon. They didn't have anything in the way of airplane door knockers. The woman walks us to the back of her store, which I get because that's where I would keep the most prize knockers too. We get to a rack of simple, dull, ordinary door knockers, and she says, here you go. These aren't plane knockers. Yes, they are. We're looking for plane knockers. These are all plane knockers. There is not one single plane knocker on this wall. These are all plane knockers. I, I trust that you, like me, immediately see what's happening. I, of course, don't intervene right away, mostly for my own entertainment. I want to see if these two are going to have a mini wing open. They don't. Damn it. Then I intervene. Ma'am, my partner and I are looking for an airplane door knocker. Oh. I'm sorry, we don't have any of those. Now, Jen knew exactly what she was saying, and so did the owner, but neither one of them was saying the same thing. They were just talking past and over each other. Jen and I quickly learned that not everyone hears P-L-A-N-E when they hear plane. The squeeze phase on an engine, on a P-L-A-N-E, is where oxygen molecules are compressed and mushed together, which accelerates them toward the next chamber. For me, having a ringside seat to the plane plane fight, I witnessed the molecules of individual bias accelerating Jen and the owner into the chamber of misunderstanding. Our histories, our experiences, and our influencers dictate our biases. And if we're not careful, those biases can get squeezed through, unchecked, and unverified, which can lead to plain misunderstandings. Be aware of your own biases as they get squeezed and accelerated during the evolution of your great split second decisions. We share overlapping parts of what makes us who we are, but those overlaps start to disappear as we step away from our pods of commonality. 
class of 2021, did you call a friend last month and say, hey, I got my AFSC? And they're like, um, okay, did it hurt? Is that contagious? Or class of 2024, did you catch up with friends from high school over the winter break and say, dude, second beast was killer, but we made it to acceptance day and now recognition's right around the corner. And your friends are looking at you like, I know those are English words, but they made no sense in the order you just said them. The great news is we can work together to help each other accelerate our actions toward success. Sometimes we're so close to our own perspective that we become blind to anything but our own point of view. Okay, we've sucked and squeezed, but before we bang, we're going to do an exercise. Rebus puzzles, my favorite. And in case you're not familiar with them, these are puzzles that involve a combination of visual, spatial, numerical, or verbal cues in order to lead you to a common phrase or word. So I'll give you a couple quick examples just so we get the idea. And I'll get out of the way again, I'm sorry. First one, I'll give you a couple seconds to work this one out. This is a common phrase, especially for golfers. I think this is a smart group. You all know that this is a hole in one. So I guess it's not a common phrase. What well, is a common phrase, just not a common occurrence, right? Sports ball. Okay, next one. This isn't a phrase so much as a Sammy inspectable item. B E D. And again, I'm trusting that this is a pretty smart group and you probably are all are yelling at your computers and you're yelling the word bedspread. It's the word bed spread out. So hopefully you're getting the idea of these puzzles. We're going to Grab a piece of paper, because we're going to do uh, just the eight puzzles. So I'm going to put eight Rebus puzzles on the screen. These aren't them. I want you to draw a four by two grid like this on your paper for your answers. This is going to be individual effort. You're going to get as many as you can on your own. I'm going to give you uh, 93 proud to be seconds. So hope your pen and paper are ready. Looking on your screen, you'll have 93 seconds and begin. All right, 30 seconds. My favorite Rebus puzzles. You know what? I'm going to count on this group being a smart group. Cheat my 93 seconds a little bit. We'll call time on this because I know you're still going to work even after I say time. So I won't even say pencils down. What I do want to know is I want to know how many puzzles you think you got right. So back over to Kahoot, please. What I want you to do is type in a number, zero to eight. Do not spell out the word, just type in an Arabic number, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. If anyone types in nine, I'll know you're not paying attention. And if anyone types in Roman numerals, well, that's just mean. Look, all these people probably typing in eight. Why am I seeing more than nine numbers on there? That doesn't make sense. Hang on a second. This is how many puzzles you think you got right. Somebody gonna type my mom again? All right, let's see how we did. Somebody got pie, okay? Somebody got nine. Oh, somebody got eight. All right. Let's do a quick answer key. Uh, since somebody's got 3.14 and whoever got nine, this one's for you. We're just going to put a quick answer key up there and you can grade your own work. So top left, 
three blind mice. The next one was take from the rich and give to the poor. The one across that is long time no see, then gray matter, bottom left, summer school, scrambled eggs, tennis shoes. I've had a lot of debate over this one. We're only going with tennis shoes for now. And then backwards glance. So good on you, whoever got 3.14. All right, individual success with these puzzles relies on using our previous experiences, our own lateral thinking skills, our own frames of references and biases. If we had crowdsourced the answers, you know, closer than six feet apart without plexiglass and mask and shots of hand sanitizer, the crowd would get more together. Team success relies on leveraging our teammates experiences, their frames of references and their biases. Sometimes our biases blind us from an answer that is so clear to someone else just because they look at it differently than you do. But together, you can solve the puzzle. Leveraging someone else's biases can help us overcome our own. And because I don't want to be biased, I don't want to leave out the next most important element of the internal combustion engine. Because after we have sucked, and squeezed, it's time to bang. So speaking of bangs, let's talk about my landings. It's a UPT flight debrief and we're talking about my landings. I know everybody knows enough about flying to know that landings are pretty important. And well, I am pretty bad at them. By bad, I mean some instructors are physically banged up after flying with me and other instructors won't fly with me because they know about the instructors I've banged up. Anyway. We're in the debrief and my landings today have been particularly bad. Uh, Barrett, I can't recommend you proceed in this program until you improve your landings. Yes, sir. Sounds about right. You see, I know all my landings are going to get the little U for unsat, which I have definitely earned. So the overall flight is going to get the big U still for unsat and still definitely warranted. And of course, too many unsatisfactory grades means you'll never be a pilot. Not in our Air Force anyway, we do have standards. Now, as Molly mentioned in the beginning, nobody else in my UPT class thus far had hooked a ride. So if I'm correct in predicting the path I'm on, I will have the distinct honor of being the first person in my pilot training class to get an unsat. Barrett, your landings, they aren't good. Do you understand you're getting an unsat for the entire ride? Uh, yes, sir, I know. Now his nervousness, is odd to me because most people are nervous before they get in a plane with me. Do you need to be excused? Uh, for what? You want to go to the bathroom? Uh, I don't know what's going on here. I do a quick bladder check. No, nope, I'm good there. I wonder if there's an odor I'm being blamed for. No, nope, good there too. I'm sorry, sir. Why do I need to go to the bathroom? Don't you want to cry? No. What a weird debrief this has become. Uh, okay, so you know you failed the ride and you don't want to go to the bathroom and cry. Yes, and correct. It turns out I'm his first female student and the warnings he's been given about us is that we will cry if given bad news, like being told we failed a ride, even if it's the truth, which in my case it is. In that moment, I realize I have an option because did I want to cry? Absolutely. In that split second, I decide to keep my focus on improving my landings rather than make a short term reaction. That split second decision guides me to stay and absorb the honest feedback I need in order to improve. In the internal combustion engine, that bang chamber is the power stroke. My power lies in how I act in this moment and the choice I choose to make is to own the reality of the situation and not default to an emotional response that can't fix anything, even if that's what my instructor expects me to do. The decision we make about how to behave in that moment of action, what we do in that split second, what we say in that split second, that says a lot about us. Our prior experiences influence every situation we encounter. There are multiple interpretations and possible outcomes. Think about how you can, will, or do use the raw data of all your characteristics, your past experiences, and your personal biases in your decision making, especially as a leader, when many eyes will be on you. What more deliberate and thoughtful split-second decision will you make 
because you have invested the time to gather information and assess alternative resolutions. It's never the situation that changes, it's our interpretation of it. It isn't the facts that change, it's our willingness to uncover as many of them as we can. Fitting our prior knowledge and calibrating our expectations to the situation at hand helps us create more meaningful interpretations. Because our brains are dealing with different levels of ambiguity from moment to moment. Now, I trust that the behavioral sciences and leadership department have shown you all these ambiguous images. So we're going to go through a quick, short round of what do you see? So the first one, what do you see, frog or horse? If you see the frog first, see if you can't get yourself to see the horse. If you see the horse first, see if you can't get to see the frog. Next one, what do you see, rabbit? or duck. Same thing as before. If you see the duck first, see if you can't see the rabbit. If you only see the rabbit, see if you can't get yourself to see the duck. If you're still seeing a horse, again, hit refresh. Now, the interpretive dance variation is which way is she spinning? Some of you think she's spinning left. Some of you think she's spinning right. And you're both right, as in correct. Same thing as before, if you don't see her spinning at all, hit refresh or change internet service providers. Once you have convinced yourself that she's spinning left or right, try to see if you can get her to spin in the opposite direction. There is more than one reality than the way we think we see, interpret, or understand something. But if I make the simple addition of a letter, maybe then you can change the way you interpret the information. That one subtle addition of a letter can completely change the way that information is interpreted. So keep that in mind the next time you are confronted with an opinion that's different from your own, or the next time you witness a fight over a plain plane. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one more. Uh, how many mittens do you see? <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> Good old Bernie. How we see the world and whether we're open to other possible explanations influences the decisions we make. We can be quick to judge or we can take the time to make effective decisions. And after that split second bang, then what? If you recall 1200 seconds ago, I told you a story about me grabbing my motor glider instructor's leg during his demo of the stall recovery, one of my finer moments of airmanship. In order to make it through the sewing program, I had to apply the lesson of don't do that again to future flights. So not wanting the input of being that cadet accelerated through previous experience of a stall and stall recovery, that fueled me to act differently for follow on stalls and stall recoveries. And I learned I did behave differently in follow on stalls, in stall recoveries, in soaring. It's the summer after my two day year and I'm in the Cessna 172 for powered flight. Again, on the agenda is the ridiculous, let the plane fall out of the sky maneuver. Same setup as before. Instructor pilot to my right, stuck flying with a college kid who now knows she's all that because she's made it through three years at the academy. Points the nose of the plane to the sky, pulls back on the throttle, we lose upper momentum and the plane starts shaking. We are once again in a stall and now the plane starts looking for a flying attitude. Past experience has taught me to expect the plane to go from nose high to nose low, or nose high to right wing low, or even left wing low. By this time, I'm even more of a planner, and I need to know what's about to happen. The plane goes from nose high to nose low, and then the instructor aggressively executes the stall recovery, which most of you know, puts the plane into a secondary stall. Now call it natural reaction, call it automated response, or call it poor airmanship, I grab my instructor's leg. This is now the second plane I've flown and the second instructor I've groped. In the interest of time, let me just fast forward a couple more years to pilot training in the T-37 doing an unloaded recovery, which is where the plane finds its flying added to wherever it damn well pleases, which today is behind us. So as we started unexpected lazy float backwards and upside down, you may not be surprised to learn that I grabbed my instructor's leg. My leg gripping evolution spanned five years, three different airframes and three separate instructors. 
just like in gliders at T41s and tweets, to become a pilot, I had to let go of my instructor's leg to make better decisions in those stalling moments so I could adapt to that new environment and execute recoveries on my own. In the internal combustion engine, after the bang stroke, the engine recovers by blowing out combusted gases into the atmosphere, accelerating the aircraft in the opposite direction. Then everything is back to where it started, ready to repeat the whole process. My embarrassing decision, correction, decisions, reinforced my need to rely on my own skill. This means reflecting on how to adjust for the next time in order to accelerate my career forward. Now, fortunately, the split second decision I had to stop making was pretty easy. Don't grab the other pilot. And I did finally evolve, but again, it took three aircraft, three IPs in a span of five years. But isn't this the case for so many of the things that we do? We lean on, or in my case, grope others as we learn new skills in ever changing, ever changing environments. Each experience informs future decisions that we make in similar or identical situations. If you are not particularly proud of a decision you've made, learn from it. Apply that lesson to the next time. Even for decisions that you are proud of, hot wash them. See how they could have been better. Take the time to review that action, your decision. Whatever feedback technique you use is fine. Maybe it's seeing what went well, what went wrong, and what needs work. Maybe it's the four helpfuls, repeating what went right, fixing what went wrong, adding anything missing, and clarifying anything confusing. How you seek feedback is not nearly as important as the act of seeking the feedback. Success comes from applying the valuable insights from each experience to the next time, providing skills that can be applied to the next time and the next time and so on. So if the decision you make doesn't produce quite the bang you would hope for, leverage the feedback you get or the lessons you learn as an input to tweak the next iteration. That blow, those lessons, become part of the suck for the next squeeze bang. This sounds weird out of context, I apologize. Just like the internal combustion engine, you're cycling through a continuous feedback loop and what you learn in the process can be shared with others and what others learn in their process can be shared with you. I believe it was called mentorship back in the day. So in the same breath of recommending constant feedback, I want your feedback about your main takeaway from our time together here. This will be our last Kahoot question. You can type up to 250 characters to capture your main takeaway. Then once you've typed out what your main takeaway has been, Kahoot will ask you to pick one key word from your sentence. And this is by no means an official survey. I just want to make sure that something landed. Ba-dum-bum. Give you two minutes on this one. What is your primary takeaway from today? It can even be your favorite joke, favorite thought, maybe a conversation that's happened in the chat. Primary takeaway from your time, from our time together here. Again, you can type up to 250 characters and then Kahoot will ask you to pick one key word. Yeah, whoever typed in 3.14 last time, a little slower on the uptake, huh? One minute remaining. I appreciate the thought everybody's putting into these. All right, New Year's Eve countdown happening now. The suspense is riveting. 
This is actually my feedback session right here. All right, 124. Hey, you know what, people? Thank you so much for playing. I love this. Oh, I love that. More roles than I can count. Taking the time to realize all the roles I have on a daily basis. Learning, evolving, decisions, enthusiasm. Oh, that was my enthusiasm. Well, thank you. Last split second. It's like people are listening. This this just made my day. Change takes time. Power. Oh, these are great. We'll just scroll through these really quickly, and I'm happy to pull the report. Um, this means a lot to me. Again, this is my feedback session. Learn from your mistakes. These are great. Oh, fantastic. That just made my day. All right. Well, I don't want to stall out. So I challenge you to develop your future split second decisions now and use suck, squeeze, bang, blow. I also challenge you to forget suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Realize that the fuel that sucked into your decision making engine is a complex inventory of all the roles that make you, you. Those different roles that you play in life affect the unique perspective that bring your actions and bring out your unique perspective in your actions as a leader. Knock on the doors of classmates and mentors and learn from and share with others in order to squeeze and accelerate your experiences to get you through any puzzling challenges. Do not cry if you bang up yourself or anyone else with a decision that you're not entirely proud of. Stay focused on your successes as you ignite those inputs and experiences into action. When you need to, blow out a quick exhale and then review the feedback from your action and then begin again. Suck that feedback in for the next round of action. We have endless opportunities to suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. So invest the time now and be ready to make great split second decisions in your future. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, thank you for um, great involvement. If anybody has any questions or comments or smart remarks, I'm available at heymo at mobarrett.com. There's my cell phone number. And uh, congratulations, we'll all get the badge on achievement in adulting today. Thank you so much. And uh, if there's time for questions, um, Molly, I will hand it over to you. Mo, thank you so much for your inspiring words today. <laughs> we will now begin our question and answer portion uh -oh. of the event. We ask that you ask questions for Colonel Barrett using the Zoom Q&A function that's at the bottom of the screen. And then I will present your questions as they come in. We only have a little bit of time left, but we'll try to get through just a couple. So the first question from the audience that came in pretty early into the presentation was, ma'am, have you had to deal with discrimination in the Air Force? And if so, how did you handle it? I think everybody deals with discrimination in life. Uh, we're always going to be discriminated against something, the way we view the world, the way we dress, the way we look, the way we talk, you name it. Um, I'm sure I have dealt with discrimination, um, meaning that it's, I've, it's been come my way. Um, I don't know if I'm just not smart enough to see it or recognize it, but all I can ever do, and this is not just in the Air Force or anything, but just in life, is I rely on personal competence and professional competence. And what I mean by that is, Whatever task is at hand, be good at it. Learn to be good at, good at it, which it means like make yourself better at it, find out how to improve on that and just be a good person. It's that simple. Because I think what we get caught up in is all these labels, right? I'm this demographic dream. That's what I say, half Asian, gay, female, military academy grad. Those are just labels. That has nothing to do with who I am. It colors who I am, but that's not who I am because what we are is not who we are. So I think that when we look at the contribution we have to make, um, it's about just doing your job well professionally and doing your job well personally, like being a good person and being a good worker. And I think everything else will take care of itself. And sometimes it's an education process on somebody who's not used to somebody who can be or look or think differently than them. And then just standing up for who you are and being good at who you are and good at what you do. Thank you, Mo. Yeah. The next question is, what role are you most proud of in your life, whether it's professional or personal? Oh, gosh, this is going to be cliche. I am most proud of my role as a daughter. Um, uh, people know who, who have seen me on Facebook or social media. I love my mom, and uh, she puts up with me 
and again, my role has evolved. She's in a nursing home right now. And so with COVID, I can't see her, but I call her every day. Um, and just to make her laugh makes me, um, that's, that's my proudest role. Doesn't get any better than that, sorry. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. The next question is, how did you reconcile integrity first with your homosexuality in your early years of service? Great question. Uh, tough question. I struggled with it um, for a long time, a long time. I struggled with it growing up because I um, grew up in a very conservative household. I, I am a strong Christian, grew up with that and battled with that. Um, I won't get into the depression and those kind of things, but um, struggle with it deeply. My conviction about, again, that gay was just one of those labels. Um, my conviction that I had a contribution to make um, despite that label, um, definitely, and I had a lot of friends that, you know, we were closeted initially and, and had to get out either on their own accord or were forced out. Um, and, and fortunately we're in a situation where that's, um, no longer a prohibited condition of service, but, uh, it was not an easy challenge to deal with. And, and the integrity first definitely, uh, was tough. How had I dealt with it? Again, I just looked at the bigger picture and that that label of being gay or you know there was a time when women couldn't serve or there's women women couldn't serve in combat those kind of things but having the conviction that you can still contribute uh despite those prohibitive labels is really what what carried me through my belief that i still had something to offer uh, to the service perfect thank you ma'am the next question is, how do you have a conversation and get across to someone if they have a very hard time changing their perspective? Ooh, are, are you talking about me? Is that, was that addressed to me or about me? But, I'm not um, sure. <laughs> you know, I, I think, <laughs> so hang on a second. I think the biggest thing is, I always say it's not what we do, it's how we do. So I think difficult conversations are what we do. How we have difficult conversations is the important part. So I think that, um, you know, and everybody needs to be approached differently. Everybody looks at the world and hears feedback and some people don't want feedback, but some people ask for it and don't want it. And some people, you know, all those things, but it's the how we do that, how we broach those conversations and how we approach those people. Um, and it's finding maybe you're not the right person to deliver the message, but having who, who's on their team that you can kind of help with. And it and it's a slow moving ship, not to make a nautical analogy to an Air Force Academy. I'm not sure why I did that. But, you know, you have to be patient. And we also have to go into situations without the assumption that we have the right answer. There's always, you know, maybe they have a perspective and an approach and we have a perspective and approach, but somewhere in the middle is the, the a perspective and approach that's going to work for both of them. So it's having the difficult conversations, first of all, but having it in a way that benefits both people and doesn't tear anybody down and looking at the issue at hand um, and also finding out why, why is that person like that? And it's also good for us to ask ourselves, why are we like that? Why do we think that we're right and they're wrong? So again, it's not shying away from the difficult conversations. It's figuring out the right way to have a productive conversation. Thank you, ma'am. And then our last question from the audience, and we only have about a minute to answer it. Okay, I'll go it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, how do you suggest that the difference in treatment between enlisted and officers be handled, uh, where enlisted airmen tend to struggle with items without the resource circle that officers do? Um, I, I think for the enlisted side, and, and this goes for anybody who is outranked by someone else, we need to ask, we need to make sure that we don't work for mind readers. So if there's a resource we need, ask for it. If there's help we need in how to do our jobs, ask for that help. Again, it's not what we do, it's how we, it's not like, dude, you owe me this. It's, hey, you know, my job would be a lot better and I could contribute a lot more if I had X. Um, and it's, again, it's having that conversation. And the same thing with anybody we supervise is, we need to make sure that we are ensuring that they are um, they have all the tools they need, whether those are fiscal resources or time resources, any what they are. So ask the question, hey, do you have everything you need to, you know, is there a way that you think you can have do something better? I think it's just asking the question and stop assuming. We need to all stop assuming that he's got what he needs and he's just here to mess things up on purpose. So just making sure that people um, have what they need, feel comfortable to ask for what they need 
and making sure it's it's got to go both ways. We need to make sure that we're asking for people the opportunity to, to be heard. And it's off. It's also, you know, finding the opportunity for us to be heard. So, you know, whichever way, you know, laterally up or down, we just need to make sure that we are not mind readers and that we make sure that we ask what would make your job easier? What would make your day easier? So just, just ask, ask the why. Mo, thank you again for your time today. We really appreciate your willingness to share your perspectives with us. And if I'm getting the numbers right in your 10,131 days since graduation and your 1,061 days since retiring as a Colonel in the Air Force. So thank you again for sharing your perspectives and your experiences with us. Okay. <laughs> it's definitely enriched our view of warrior ethos. Um, and it means a lot to us as cadets that are going to commission on into the Air Force and the Space Force as officers. As a token of our appreciation, a commemorative plaque, and we don't have the whole auditorium here to say plaque after I say it, <laughs> is on its way to you. <laughs> we hope you remember your time with us as fondly as we'll remember our time with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Molly.